maybe it's just from this maybe it's just what I'm seeing, but it reflects what you were saying about the music being so precise, and I hear it I mean sometimes I think it's that way because there may be other things lacking, and this is not going to a negative thing I'm talking about because. It takes time for things to grow. You take a seed, you plant the ground, and and uh, it takes time. You you don't dig a hole beside the seed you planted and and try to force it up. It has to happen on its own. You know, it's like you said, organic. And music is that way. And so, I feel a lot of times, perhaps things are arranged and precise and everything to make up for the lack of substance, perhaps, um, that will eventually follow, um, you know, given time. I remember Clark Perry, when I was in Europe doing a concert tour with um, alto saxophone, Miss Bud Shank and um, Clark Terry on trumpet, and the three of us, we're scheduled to do a concert at the Opera House in East Berlin. And um, Clark flew in to Berlin, met him at the airport. And he said to me when we got off, when he got off the plane, he says, when, when do you want to do the rehearsal? And I said, well, there's no rehearsal. And he kind of looked at me and I said, well, <laughs> you know, you and, you and Ben and I, we know some tunes, some standards, and we'll pick the standards, and we'll just... But he says, don't we want to arrange it? I says, no, we don't have to arrange it, we'll just listen. And and he looked at me, and then he came over and just hugged me and kissed me on my cheek. Wow. He says, David, this is the way this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way I was brought up playing music. Um, so... No, but I want to, I want to go back to the because you made that you 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 made a very prescient point uh, and uh, Zakir and again was, yeah. let, let, Jake let me let me say this sure I'm not saying arranging music is bad I know I know and I'm not saying doing it the way I'm doing it is the right way there's no value judgment here it's just the way I do it and and Clark could relate to that and I just trying to show the differentiation maybe between a lot of those old players that um, kept the level of their playing perhaps equal with the substance they're in. So there wasn't so wide a gap between the two. Does that make sense? Well, what I was really interested in uh, when I interviewed Zakir Hussein, the tabla player, he said that one of the issues going on today is what you were talking about, was the idea of, uh, you know, someone plants a seed and there's no time for it to germinate. There's no time because you're on to the next thing, and then the next thing, and then the next thing. So there's no substance. That's the substance you can marinate in that if it's if you let it develop. But today, an idea comes along, and within a week, it's gone. There's a new idea, and then there's a new idea. So it's sort of this frenetic pace, and therefore, people, younger musicians feel obligated to sort of keep up with the techn- technology or keep up with these fleeting ideas instead of just holding firm and diving into the substance of ultimately individual sound, Dave, which, and you know, I just wanted to play you a piece of music here, uh, kind of encapsulating what we've been talking about. So hang loose, take a listen, and we'll come back and, and we'll talk about it. Okay.
Mr. Uh, David Friesen. We have a game on this on this program called uh, Name That Tune. So, uh, are you? I love you know. I love I love Joe Bonner. <laughs> you right, nailed you it. Know. <laughs> no, I do. I, I love Joe Bonner and and Chris Billy's. That's the one that was recorded in Paris. The, for the audience, that was uh, Black Saint um, by uh, Billy Harper, um, and that song was called Call of the Wild, Peaceful Heart. And, Friesen, I want to go back to this whole idea. Okay, the thing, when I, when I, when I think of jazz, everybody has their own definition of the word, but I, I, I'm mixing what we talked about before, which is the organic, uh, you know, the organic nature of music with... Um, with spirituality, not not a you know necessarily um, you know inside a church or a synagogue spirituality, but I mean I would like you to talk about some of these African musicians. So many of them you had a chance to play with Joe Henderson and Billy Harper, guys that are still Joe Bonner. I mean these guys were playing from the from from they were playing gospel. I mean they were playing spiritual, visceral music. You can't do that. You can't replicate that in academia. No, the academia gives you the tools, um, and you acquire the tools, and what happens is a lot of people display the tools. They show you all the tools they have. Okay, great. Now build something with those tools. That's right. For That's instance, right. if you look around right now, I, I don't know your studio. You're in Tucson, is that right? That's right. Yeah, I've never been to your studio, so I don't know what it looks like. But if you look at your studio, it doesn't look like the tools it was built with. And so that's the idea. You take the tools and you construct something with them. And they're not to resemble. You don't bury a hammer into the wall and says, this was built with a hammer, <laughs> uh, a harmonic minor scale. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So another way to say it is this. And it's very interesting because this Billy Harper band and uh, I think was that the album called Black Saint Black Saint with uh, and then the the uh, rest in peace Virgil Jones on trumpet and then this drummer Malcolm Pinson I've never heard of this cat which just he was a friend of Billy's that went uh, from Texas uh, who has since passed away yeah so that was the yeah, and that was the album Black Saint from 75 right um, Billy was in Seattle and I teach in Seattle. I have students in Seattle and Portland, and so I make uh, maybe three or four trips up to Seattle um, each month. And uh, what, do, what do they call it? It was, it was Billy Hart, and uh, I forget what they call themselves, Billy Hart and Susan McBee and, and um, uh, Billy Harper, uh, Eddie Henderson. Right. I don't know. I don't know. what do they, have, they have a name for themselves? Yeah, they do. And <laughs> anyways, I went in to hear it and uh, wanted to say hello to Billy and, and Cecil and, and Billy Hart and Eddie. Cause I, you know, worked with all those guys. And, of course. And I didn't work with Cecil, but I knew Cecil quite well. Anyways, um, I was standing in the back, and they came off this bandstand, and Billy walked towards me. We hadn't seen each other in years. Uh, since I did a solo thing at the IHAE, it was the IHAE convention then in New York many years ago. And, and Billy stopped and looked at me and he said, is that you inside there? <laughs> <laughs> so that's another way wow. of saying what I'm trying to express. The the they are the warriors the the cookers they call themselves the cookers right there you go there you that's go. what they call it thank you to my, my engineer Oscar for pulling that up so yeah can, I mean great so, group can you go so Billy I mean was looking inside this this it's the soul element reason I mean when I see you I I just I just long for that authenticity to see your face agape playing the bass unfettered unconcerned focused focused in the moment staying in the moment that is what it's about man you and glenn moore i mean it's like it, this is like this is just what you did with john hurd it's that spontaneity it's the ability to say i i know my technique but what do i really am say what do i really have to say for myself what am i really going to say am i just going to comp tunes 
or am I going to write these tunes with all these complex charts or am I just going to swing swing and that's the thing that I just I continue to try to reach back to promote these kinds of situations and I think that it leads into the I think the point is this you you brought up a point about using the tools that you have but you had an opportunity to use tools like can you talk a little bit about Jerry Heldman's Jazz Cafe and the kinds of guys that would come in there how loose it was how late it stayed open how much opportunity you had to play there and sort of get comfortable using your tools you know it's interesting you you, you broke up a little bit then but I think you said Jerry Heldman right That's right yeah yeah there's a new CD that just came out uh, Jerry passed away um, last year October and his daughter brought me a sack, a, a shopping sack of cassettes. <laughs> About, uh, it was unbelievable. And she asked me if I could wade through all this <laughs> and come up with something of Jerry's music. This is old technology. I had a cassette player. I had to set it up, <laughs> and I had to wade through uh, at least a hundred cassettes. And but I did it because Jerry was a very close friend of mine, and produced a CD called Jerry Heldman's Revelations, and it's music from that time period at his coffee house called the Longolin, mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, that is out on Origin Records now. It just came out. And on it, uh, Jerry's playing piano and bass, and when he's not playing the piano, I'm playing piano, and he's playing bass. And so we switch, much like Glenn Moore and I do uh, now. But Jerry was the very first person I did this with, and he was an unbelievable soul. Uh, uh, I remember Mel Waldron and I driving in the car together one time from L.A. to San Francisco, and I put on a, a cassette <laughs> recording of Jerry playing piano, and, and Mel was stunned. Mel thought it was some of the most honest stuff he had heard mm -hmm. in, in years. So Jerry, Jerry's self-taught on piano. I'm self-taught on, 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 on the piano. And sometimes when you don't... When you're not so educated, when you don't understand things theoretically so precisely, there's a freedom in that, and it allows other things to come through. It's like when you go to Europe and you talk with someone, you have to talk slowly and express yourself. You can't use the cliches, the idioms that we're, that we're used to saying, just to cover some space with with words, you know, we have to really speak from our heart because we have to sp speak slowly because we're speaking maybe with people that don't speak English so well. Mm -hmm. And so we have to speak more purely. It's a little bit like that, I think. Um, and that's what was happening at Jerry's Coffee House. We mingled with, you know, I remember Randy Brecker was hanging out there, and this is in the 60s, and he, at that time, he was telling <laughs> Randy and I went down to the musicians' scene and we were putting notices on the musicians' board, you know, for gigs and things like that. And uh, Randy was telling me about his little brother, Michael, who was going to be a great saxophone player someday because <laughs> he was practicing uh, ten hours a day every day. The uh, I'm looking here on. Uh... This is from 73, I guess those analogs were uh, from 73 and 74, and there was uh, you, Dave Friesen on bass, piano, Jerry Heldman on bass, flute and piano, uh, Sam LaPuma. You have it there? Sam LaPuma on guitar, and then Alan Pimitel on drums. I'm just looking it up online. Um, yeah. You know, but this right. this is a fact. So you, I guess my, my idea was that what was the, one thing that's fascinating is just, the circuit. I mean, who passed through there? Uh, you know, you, you, who do you have a chance to play with when you were just? I mean, was Cannon coming in there? And, and obviously, you know, we're we're uh, you know, trained and all these 
these heavies that came before you, but you were able to see them play up close and personal. Talk about that circuit that was coming through the Pacific Northwest. Well, there was a jazz club in, in uh, Seattle called the Penthouse. It was at the foot of uh, Cherry Street on First Avenue. And Charlie Puzo was running this club. And I remember uh, Charlie was a pretty hefty guy. I think he was an ex-boxer. A pretty rough guy. But I remember when Coltrane came in for the week, <laughs> that music really, uh, I think it scared Charlie. He wasn't there for the whole week. <laughs> but the club was packed. It was jammed. I think he did better business with Coltrane than anyone else. But I was playing in a band with Joe Brazil. Joe Brazil was a tenor player out of Seattle who's actually on the CD Ohm uh, that was recorded uh, live and, and another one called I think it's either Ohm or live in Seattle and uh, I was playing in Joe's band that's with, with uh, Mike Mandel was playing um, piano piano mm-hmm. Mike Mandel was part of Larry Coriel's band absolutely Seven, yeah. Was, yeah and Mike Mandel was on piano and George Griffin on drums and myself on bass and sometimes Jerry would play with us too Jerry Heldman and so it'd be two bases. And so I got to play opposite uh, Coltrane's group and just Miles and, and Wes Montgomery and all the people that came through had a chance to play opposite these people and hang out. Uh, Albert Stinson, and you know who he was, Albert Stinson? Well, it's incredible that you bring him up is because I've been doing a lot of interviews with Jim Keltner, the drummer, and he uh, grew up with uh, this guy Jack Folks and Albert Stinson and Charles Lloyd gave them the the band title the Modern Jazz Proteges because they used to come see him play. I mean Stinson has been all over the the radar. Uh, a brilliant yeah. cat who died really young, but not. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, listen, Friesen's this. I mean, we're talking to to someone in the same class. You are in the same discussion. I guess what I'm saying is the, being able to. How much, how much uh, individual confidence and in your own ability to go out and do your own thing did that have to do with seeing Wes, seeing consistent titans who might have had day jobs in Indianapolis come out there and just burn? I didn't have a lot of focus at that time. I knew I loved to play music. and But, you know, I, I, I was on a path. Mm -hmm. You know, I I get on the highway and drive to New York City, which I've done, by the way, 26 (laughs) times from Portland to New York and back. Uh, Mazel tov. That's beautiful. Beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) If there's any uh, physical um, uh, um, uh, ah, my words, a demonstration of my sincerity, you can use that one 26 times from here to New York and back to play. And, and and so I was really caught up with playing, but I didn't know why, you know, because when I started on the highway, I know I'm on a path towards or on the road towards New York, but I, I'm not at New York. I can't see what's ahead of me. And so I was on a path. I knew I loved to play jazz. This was very important for me. But things became clear as I moved along, and things opened up for me. And then they, the, the life gave me more clarity and why I was playing music, why I was called to play music. Uh, and then I made adjustments on that path as, as things became more clear. I made certain uh, adjustments, maybe stepped out of certain places I was in that I, that would uh, maybe lead me astray and, and, and down a different path. And and so I had more focus as I moved along and things became clear. And, and uh, um, yeah, so it's just, I guess I'm just uh, stating no, the I, obvious. Well, you know, could you, could you, for all of us. Could you talk a little bit about uh, an, uh, some particular situation that helped you gain clarity? Um, yeah, um, you know, I had been seeking for years ever since the uh, when I first started playing bass in 1962, or, or at least a couple of years after that, and why I was playing music. What was the reason for it? Because it wasn't enough for me just to have fun and enjoy it. I I, I wanted to. Um, 
I wanted to know why I was playing, and 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 what uh, preface that was was um, was there a God that created us all? Was this you know what was my life all about? So I started investigating and uh, pursuing you know um, reading different books and just talking to people and. To, to find out if there really was a God. And I became confused by man's opinions. I became uh, confused by the vanity and by egos and, and just, you know, intellectualism and, and, and the way we do to try to puff ourselves up and make ourselves important in life, that power. And so I just, um, start praying as says, if there really is a God reveal yourself to me and make yourself known I can't deal with the intellectualism everything's becoming just too perfect and precise and too much vanity and ego and so if you're there reveal yourself to me so slowly but surely um, um the Lord started revealing um, and making things clear to me. And on this path, part of the process was finding out why I was playing music. What's the reason for this? You know, uh, I thought, well, you know, if if there is a God, then that God created music. If there is a God, then that God created me and put the desire in me to play music and gave me the love for music. So I thought, well, my first responsibility then would be to find out if there is a God. It made sense to me. It's like going to the very root, you know, of it all. So that was my first um, you did it on your own, though. I've, I mean, you, you, you were... Yes, I did this yeah. on my own. Yeah, right. I, was, I, I didn't want to belong to a group mm-hmm. and be under the mm-hmm. religiosity mm-hmm. And, and the traditions of the church. And it just gets bogged down with with bureaucracy. <laughs> no, I really this, dig it. I dig it. I dig it so much. Is, I wasn't interested in that. Anyways, in answer to your question, I had to preface uh, uh, my answer to your question a little bit, just give you a little background. But sure. I had a, it's a long, there was a two page, uh, not two, two issue, um, uh, of two issues of Cadence magazine, uh, from 2005. I think it was the May and the June issue, uh, that w- William Minor did a, like a seven, eight hour interview with me in New York. And, um, there was so much information that Cadence had to bring out a two part interview. And I talk a lot about this in that article and cadence uh i i there was a coffee house i had called c law in portland oregon back in the 70s and um i had been living on a farm prior to that i moved from seattle to a farm in woodland washington and so i drove a tractor for a year planted seeds to um for to raise hay that we used to feed the cattle. It was a cattle ranch. It was my dad and his brother's ranch. So my wife and um, my son, Scotty, and and uh, uh, Davey, we only had two kids at that time, lived on the farm for a year. And and um, I was driving a tractor, and one day this this plan for a, a puppet show. I When I was a young kid in, in grade school, I had puppet shows for the kids and I would do these little puppet shows so <laughs> I hadn't thought about this for years and I'm driving a tractor and all of a sudden into my mind pops a plan to make a puppet house for puppet shows and all the plans came into my mind I went down to the lumber yard and bought all the things I thought I needed I had written nothing down uh, actually when I finished ma- making this puppet house I had like a, a six inch piece of two by four left so I actually got just the right amount of wood. It was a puppet house that you could stand up in. It had a folding roof. It was a collapsible, and it was painted purple and yellow and 
some other colors. It was really bright. It was for kids. And when I finished it, my wife says, what are you going to do with this? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, I guess put it in the barn. I have no use for it <laughs> <laughs> at that time. So I put it in the barn. A couple of years later, I was hunting for a place to have a, 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 a coffee house, like sure. the Longland in Seattle. And uh, to make a long story short, I, fi- I found a place. I was a lawyer in town that owned this building that was full of junk. He says, if you can clear this out, you can. He says, I'll just give it to you rent free. Wow. And you can go to my lumber yard and charge whatever you want and fix it up, and, 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 and you can just have it rent free. I'll let you use it. So I got a junker to come and take out all the junk, and as a reward, I gave him like two or three oak tables, antiques that were in the place, and he cleared everything out. And then I spent a year on my own tearing down a wall and putting up a ceiling. I worked in there for a year to get this place together. And and, and uh, when I had the stage finally built, I says, oh, I'll have puppet shows for the kids on uh, on Saturday afternoons. And when I bought brought the puppet house and put it on the stage, it fit perfectly. <laughs> it was just six inches shy of hitting the top of the ceiling. It was just perfect. Wow. Perfect. So then I said, oh, yeah, that's, well, then that's why I built that puppet house. <laughs> and so I had this thing for the kids and, 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 and the shows behind, behind the dialogue, I'd have Coltrane or Miles playing underneath the dialogue, so there was always jazz playing. <laughs> And it was a coffee house that was um, free for people. They had a donation box, and people could come in. And I'd have my group in there playing on Friday nights up and like, started at like one in the morning till about four or five. And it was isolated, so it didn't disturb the neighbors or anything. And you know, Jimmy Witherspoon and Charlie Hayden and and uh, Ralph Towner and different people when they're in town, they'd come by uh, the coffee house. So it became quite a great place to be for after hours and and uh, when I finally went on the road with Joe Henderson I had to give it up because I started traveling a lot and I couldn't run it anymore but in this coffee house I would plan my puppet uh, shows for that following Friday and I'd write the script down well one day I was in the in the midst of of uh, writing the script and all of a sudden, I saw this vision. Now, it wasn't a vision where everything outside of me changed. It was a vision inside. Um, but it was very real, and I saw this pool. It was um, a color pool, which is the name of my publishing company, and which was the name of my very first CD that came out on Muse Records. Um, but uh, Joe Fields at the time let Stardance kind of run interference, and then he brought out... Um, color pool, mm. Mm. but color pool was the very first CD, not Star Dance, uh, the first recording. Anyways, I saw this beautiful pool filled with all these colors, and it's difficult to describe the colors because they were spiritual colors. They aren't like reds, yellows, blues like we see here on Earth. <laughs> these were. There were different colors. I can't really explain. And why, how do I know they were colors? Well, uh, oh, that's a good question. But that's the best word I can come sure, up with to sure, describe yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the radiance and the beauty of it. And um, I saw the Lord dip in a ladle and let these colors flow out, the substance. And I, I said to the Lord, I said, what is this? He says, this is a color pool I've given to you to fill the note. And the Lord went on to show me that the note, the musical note, in the world, you know, people will carve illustrious designs on the note, uh, which is technique and a type of creativity, and then they put the notes in patterns, which is concepts, whether it be Western music or jazz or whatever, and they send it out to the world for people to hear. Well, the Lord says, I want you to take and fill the notes with this substance. And this substance is my love. 
And I want you to go forth and show the glory of the kingdom of God, not for your glory, and not by your power, but for my glory and from my power, which took all the glory away from me. I mean, I couldn't say, okay, this is me. I'm doing it. I'm great. It wasn't about that. And so I had to give that part of it up. I couldn't follow that path. And um, that was the purpose. And I found my purpose for playing music. And once I had my purpose, I was able to move forward in a confident way, knowing because my faith in the Lord became strong at that point. And um, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So my faith grew as the Word of God became more prevalent in my life. And so I was able to move forward. I mean, think about... I look at it, and it really is like I was walking on water, literally. I was married. I had, now at this time, four children, three sons and a daughter. My wife didn't work. She was doing homeschool, and I was supporting a family playing jazz acoustic bass. Not like I wasn't playing electric bass. I wasn't playing any kind of gigs other than jazz. That's all I was doing. And I was supporting a wife and four kids doing this. Friesen, I want Friesen. I I just feel like we're just beginning to warm up, and um, unbelievably, the end. unbelievably, we've come to the end of the <laughs> end of the hour, and we're going to have to do a part two. I'll be in touch with you <laughs> because uh, yeah. you know, I I just as we go to break, we're going to listen to a little bit of, of Dolphin Dance. Dave Friesen, thank you so much, man, and we'll be in touch. All right, I, it was an honor. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, and we'll see you all next week. new talk station in Arizona. Power Talk 1210 KEVT. Saurita Tucson.